Well, in keeping with our quest to introduce you to informed and interesting interview subjects, I'd like you to meet someone who fits that bill. His CV includes chief speechwriter for Jimmy Carter, though he doesn't look old enough. He's also written for the prestigious Atlantic magazine. He's their current national correspondent. He's been there for three decades. He's just finished a stint here as professor of US media studies at the US Studies Centre at the University of Sydney. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much. For I know you're just winding up um, yeah. as a, a visiting fellow, I gather. Yes, I, I've had a ongoing connection with the U.S. Study Center. I've been here for, with my wife for this month and uh, having another visit to Australia, which we always enjoy. I like mentioning fellowships because I did <laughs> want to say I am a fellow of Stanford University, the journalism <laughs> night one. I know people out there probably don't believe it, but it it's is very a very prestigious. It is indeed. Thank you. You took the words out of my mouth. Thank you. <laughs> No, I needed a backup on that. I enjoyed being there. So tell us your take. It's that de dreadful thing we do in this country. Yeah. What do you think? What were the impressions? I mean, I'm sure you've probably been here before, but really sitting down and studying, what, what, what are you left with? I know, as you were just saying, the politics here are a little strange. But if you compare <laughs> them with politics elsewhere, including my own home country right now, you have a lot to be grateful for. The fact that the economy here, I know there are troubles, but in the long trends, you know, China's growth is benefiting Australia. You've had a little bit of rain, as I have witnessed myself. So I think that while Australia has its problems in the world's perspective, yet again, they're a fortunate set of problems to have. Okay, well, just let's go on the politics because obviously you're in the middle of the election. <laughs> I've talked to Americans who say that they think our political discourse is getting as as nasty, as negative as we're seeing in the U.S. Do, do you find that? I mean, what are the differences? It's, it's in the hard debate? to take seriously a political discourse you're not in the middle of yourself. But I think that the United States, we're right now debating whether or not birth control pills. Are a legal or something that should be uh, outlawed or a subject of, uh, of political controversy? I don't think you've gotten to that point here. So yes, every every political culture has its uh, its eccentricities, and I know there have been those there. But right now, I'd say Republican primary politics in the U.S. probably are setting a new standard. Okay, um, what are the things that have most impressed you or underwhelmed you about about us at the moment? I think that, that, that again, it, this is a fortunate country. It's a cliche. I'm sorry to say it for, for that reason, but but um, I'll tell you something that always impresses me as an American, which is the nature of services in Australia. Public transport here in Sydney. You complain about it, but it's pretty good by <laughs> U.S. standards. Health insurance is, is good. I like the fellow feeling of Australia. I like the fact that you sit in the front seat of a taxi cab rather than distancing yourself in, in, in the rear. There is something which um, there is still even now a kind of egalitarianism in, in Australia. Australian culture, which to an American, with all of our extremes of polarized society, is, is impressive. Okay, and uh, the economy, at the moment it's rather bizarre. You went through the GFC, you had a much harder yes. time than us. You said we were about the China story. The fact is that we seem to, you've been here in a month, we, we've talked ourselves into some kind of depression, recession. Are you surprised at the gloom given that we're meant to be the economic envy of the world? Yes, and I, I know there is. there are the problems of a two-track economy where you have Western Australia and every uh, account I hear from there sounds like Gold Rush Alaska, Gold Rush Alaska with $600 hotel rooms and all the rest. So there are strong that come from that. But having that kind of underpinning for government revenues, for private revenues, it's better than having the reverse, which is a collapsing economy. What was your brief while you were down here? Were you studying everything? Um, what yes, were, are you doing it's, a piece? It's been now, now a number of years I've been involved with the U.S. Study Center, so I've been doing programs there. We had a couple of interpretive programs on the U.S. primaries. I've been working on uh, some, some ongoing issues of U.S., China, Australia, triangular relations, because uh, that obviously is the most, those are the two most important countries for Australia's long-term economic and political uh, interactions. And I've had experience in both places, plus Australia, so I've been working on programs on those. Yes, because you've spent a bit of time in China. Um, I had a guest on last night who said the party's over, they're going to have a hard landing, um, w w that maybe things in the U.S. aren't as good. Where do you see that triumvirate that is I, so important to us? I have? think that the China always has terrible problems, but for the last 30 years they've avoided disaster just at the last moment, with the exception, of course, of Tiananmen Square, or their political disaster of 20 years ago. Go. But my, my image for them is a little a raft going down a whitewater rapids. At just the last moment, it avoids the boulder, and it's done that again and again. There are some problems now. Probably the growth rate in the next year or two will not be the double-digit rate it's been for the past five or ten years. But I would bet against a big recession coming out of China. The leaders there have tools and resources to avoid a truly hard landing, it seems to me. And you talk about the fact that it's the U.S. and China that are yeah. two most important trading partners now. And, of course, there's this, this balance we're trying to maintain. There's criticism or concerns that the new foreign minister, yeah. what
what role we play if right. we go too far. Um, opening a base in Darwin will upset the Chinese. Um, where do you see that relationship going? How think, hard is it for us? Of course, us? the new foreign minister I have a special uh, feeling for because <laughs> he was a, a board member from the U.S. Study Center where I've been, been based here. And I think that Australia, again, has had it pretty much right over the last decade or two of recognizing that its economic fate and its location are here in Asia and its economy is so tied to, uh, to China and the rest of the growing Asian countries, but its culture, its political values, its military alliances are strongly linked to the U.S., the United Kingdom, and all the rest. I think there is a useful balancing role. You know, Australia is not a steering force one way or the other, but it has strong connections to both places, and I think that has worked out okay, including this, uh, this Darwin presence. Do you think we are going to inevitably need to tone down our close links with the U.S. or be more um, wary of the, how the Chinese feel about it, or can we pretty well go along the way we're doing it? I think for the foreseeable future, my impression living in China for the last couple of years has been they're in no big hurry to have military challenges in this part of the world. They have so many problems internally. The economic ones you mentioned of the hard landing, the hundreds of millions of still poor people who are there in China, the economic disaster that's evident to anybody who's been in Chinese cities or countryside. So I think for now, they're not looking to rock the boat militarily. And, and while they were somewhat flummoxed by the U.S. Uh, move and having this, this announcement in Darwin, I think it's not going to be a sort of a hostile showdown that would disrupt Australia's plans. Good, just so as we can keep digging out the dirt and sending it to them. Now, let's go to the U.S. elections yes. this year. Whenever I get depressed about what goes on in Canberra, <laughs> I look at your Republican primaries and think, you know, not so bad, really. Yes, Are uh, you surprised at how ridiculous it I is this year? I am surprised. I think most, I've seen a lot of political campaigns, as you have uh, graciously uh, mentioned, and this is the most this is the strangest one I have seen because there's no apparent adult in charge on the Republican side. <laughs> if this had been like past Republican primaries, Mitt Romney, the most likely nominee, would have been anointed in that role three or four months ago. But instead, this uh, really destructive fight is going on primary after primary. Romney will probably be the nominee, but he's been positioned so far to the extreme, I think it makes it harder for him to challenge President Obama. Yes, I noticed I, I lived in hope, but some silly aide said this week, it's like Etch a Sketch will be able to, once we, once we move, <laughs> into the once we've got the nomination yes. we can go back to the center to win the votes which is of course outrageous and I see today Rick Santorum's even offered to be on the ticket I mean is that a good ticket? And, and so etch sketches they're known in Australia uh, as, as we, well? No, we don't really have them, <laughs> well, but it basically means you pull it off. I yes, mean, we've had a similar thing, and we don't call it. You start again. So that's that, I think, yes. is hopeful that all this it, stuff he's saying, he might actually it, go back hopeful, to the centre. It's except if Romney's main burden um, on both the right and the left is a sense that he will say something today and something different tomorrow, depending on what, what's convenient. So if he's saying, well, I'm actually going to do that, something which could be a problem for him. Possibly Santorum could be on the ticket with him. Anything, I, I've learned to rule out nothing when it comes to this year's Republican field. Has the uh, Republican battle been so bruising that it's handed it to Obama? Uh, nothing has been handed to Obama. Anything could happen in Iran with Israel. Anything could happen with the economy. So nothing is certain, but certainly the odds look in his favor now compared to six months ago. And I think the improvement of the economy is the most important factor. But the second most important is just the brawling, destructive nature of the Republican fight so far and the fact that their electorate has become more white, older, more southern, and more male. A time when the U.S. Yeah, they electorate. certainly haven't won the female <laughs> vote at all. Yes, they? again, a contraception argument doesn't bring in a lot of uh, female voters. <laughs> okay, I have to ask you something else. We're all in, and, and this was the debate a couple of years ago when I was at Stanford. Um, the U.S. journalists were terribly depressed, the newspaper journalists, about the future of their jobs. We're seeing it in yes. Australia. It's all online. We're seeing publications go, the end of print media. Your publication, The Atlantic, yes. you tell me, is the oldest magazine yes. in the world. Yes, yes, well, we're the oldest. oldest this continuous publication, English language publication, the oldest magazine in the United States, started in 1857. Our only presidential endorsement was Abraham Lincoln in 1860. <laughs> well, it was a good call. It was a good call. We retired then. And so and we now have uh, become profitable because of very aggressive online strategy and events business of having big ideas conferences and a more aggressive sort of news uh, structure for our magazine. So we are here to say that it's possible even for the oldest publication in the English language of magazines to reposition itself and become uh, successful in this new environment. I'm sure that's encouraging to everyone, but you said the other uh, distinguishing factor is you've always had a single owner. You've never been yes. part of a conglomerate, which it, does, it, it, is it's an true. interesting And one. our current owner, David Bradley, who's a wonderful man, has had many years of it not being a profitable enterprise, and he invested very generously. It has not paid back his investment yet. 
at current rates, it someday will, but it, again, a single ownership can make a difference. Okay, so let's be clear. It's now making money, yes. but it's got a way to go till it makes it back. Yes, until it pays back his last 12 years of ownership. In the Just magazine. quickly, what's the quality of the journalism like here then, do you think? Uh, I think that, 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 that the newspaper world in Australia, it's more, still more firmly established than the U.S. The newspapers have relatively greater penetration here. The, the, I think it's a more serious, believe it or not, I think TV news here is on whole more serious than in the U.S. So, I so, do so there. believe it. I work for Scott. <laughs> Hi, this is yes. a box. Thank you very much for your time, My pleasure. James Fellows. Uh, and you'll be able to read Jean, James at The Atlantic when he gets back. And obviously you'd want to read it because it's survived this long. There must be something good going for it.